Yeah, dude. Thanks again for joining the podcast. It's a huge honor. You've worked on a lot of really awesome projects, two of them specifically, the APC40 and the Push, which I'm a huge fan of, and I'm sure you get that a lot. Really glad to have you on the podcast for sure. It's been a long time coming. I was just asking, you're in Philly, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So Yeah. Tell you all the dirty secrets of how these things came to be. Yeah, I would love that. All the horror stories, I'm sure, as well. I've been using the APC40 since the original came out, it would have been like 2012, I think, since I started playing with it, which obviously was a collaboration with the APC between Ableton and Akai. Not so much anymore. They kind of branched off into their own thing, I think. Yeah. So we um, guess how it started was I was working at the time I was doing um, artist relations. I started Ableton in 2005 and I was doing artist relations and sort of partner marketing and, um, you know, all those you used to get live light discs in every product, you know, it was like the America online of, uh, music software. And yeah. that was my job was to try to get as many of those live lights into, uh, keyboards as possible and different brands. And so we were excited to work with Akai. I started on an MPC 2000 XL. So that was like really exciting to get to start to work with them. Yeah. We had live light in some of their boxes, and then there were the Glenn Darcy from Akai, who's now he now leads um, a Shun Sound Machines. They do the hydrosynth. He approached Ableton with an with an idea. Some parts of what you see today, and then there were some other things that we had ideas for, and then it became kind of a, a really nice collaboration between us and them and Dan Gill and Alex Supe over there. Yeah, it was really exciting. I mean, I just remember the first time seeing the first one in like hardware was like a really exciting dream come true to see this thing that has sketches and illustrator or something like that become a real thing yeah and they had all the you know engineering know-how and i think we we brought a lot of like what what could this do in ableton live so we had our software team working on it and their hardware team working on it there had been other products maybe like that kind of worked with live but nothing quite as dedicated as that at the time i think yeah and also mass produced because there were people like I think like Robert Henko, one of our founders, had his own thing, uh, the Monodeck, and um, yeah, DJ Sasha had something, the Maven that he had created, and oh, I yeah. think um, Richie Houghton had controller that he made. So there were other like clip launching things, but they were like MIDI mapped, and you know, instead of having it just like work automatically out of the box. So that's kind of like how we got started on Push as well because we had this relationship with Akai already and you know we knew they made great hardware and we wanted to do something even more integrated and deeper that would go into the creation side instead of just the performance side mm -hmm. the beauty of it is that right now like I can plug the APC 40 into my push standalone and they work really well together and it's uh yeah it's still like I love the mark II and I I, I haven't tried the mark three yet but um but I but it's uh it's a great combo still because what you could have just a dedicated session and then your creation note mode and drums and instruments on push. But Yeah, totally. It's a perfect marriage. I, I feel like the push and the APC are both like very timeless in a sense, especially with the APC. I feel like it has such a wide uh, use application. So like people use it for show visuals. People use it outside of just Ableton Live. I mean, it can be used for a lot of different things. The push is, is really the same. It's just mostly married. It's just married and created for Ableton, obviously, and was the first in-house controller that Ableton really made. And I definitely want to pick your brain on that, too. But before we dive into all that, like, really good nerdy controllerism stuff, uh, I would love for people just to get to know you a little bit better, um, maybe a little bit of your background in music and, like, how that led you to working with Ableton and the company. Tell people a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I'm mostly from Philadelphia. This is where I grew up. I played guitar from an early age and, uh, you know, which I think still influenced the layouts for push and things like that. Got into, you know, all kinds of rock. There were some metal years, there's jazz years and learning as much as I could about guitar was, was my, my main passion, I think in the beginning. And then somewhere along the way, and then I went to, I went to university for, uh, like classical composition, which I, I don't think I've written on a music staff or done classical music since I graduated, but 
but it was a good foundation for theory and things like that. Oh yeah. And a little, little time at Berkeley for some jazz guitar, you know, it was right around like I graduated in 98. So it was, you know, you were starting to see the first soft synths and stuff like that. And reason I think was big for me. That was, well, I guess even before that I used a four track to like record guitars and, I think I started on Opcode Vision at Berkeley for a little bit, which was was really cool to be able was my first MIDI sequencing. But the MPC really got me into it. Um, in, I was out in San Francisco at the time with my brother, and we would just you know sample records and uh, and DJ and and things like that, and uh, and try to mix it all together. And then it was like, okay, cool, I got this beat. Oh, it would be great if it was you know if it was just like a little bit faster and that was so hard to do back then, you know? And, and I think that's where like live first came in. I think I had like a G4 tower or something. And I was experimenting with lots of different music software at the time. And then I was, I was writing music reviews at the time for uh, accelerator magazine. Then I became the music technology editor there. So that got me like really deep into reviewing MIDI gear and, mm. Uh, and Ableton Live and Logic and all kinds of it was, I think I reviewed Ableton Live two or three. And um, wow, it's been a while. And, uh, you know, kissing ass gets you everywhere. You had a good <laughs> review and that got the notice of Ableton. So that's great. Yeah. And in there, I've I've been really into studying. I like to study a lot of world music, too. But but I make hip hop and electronic music in my in my own time. And I have kind of like an R&B band and um, with my colleague at Ableton. Brian Mullion. Yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm just I'm making music every night. You know, I'm I'm as into it as you are as anyone is. That's great. And I think that like I'm a loud complainer, you know, about oh, this feature should do that in live and on push. And we all are super passionate about it. I think we'll get more into this, but the push software team, like everybody on that team play makes music and uh like all the developers, user researcher. Everybody's got a synthesizer or trombone or a banjo or something. And that's really great because we all kind of like know what the feature means. You know, I think instead of just like coding something a designer does. No, that's really important. I think that's a huge benefit um, for hiring somebody is like, are they actively making music? Are they actually using these potential products that either we're creating or have created rather than just all head theory of coding or software developing? Because there's more practical application, I feel like, if you're active in that field. Yeah, and they can, you know, question the designs too. And like, I may say something and then somebody's like, well, you know, did you think about this for this user group? And that's a, I mean, that's a big challenge for us is just like, I'm like, oh, in hip hop, it has to work like this. That's the way we have to load it. And somebody's like, well, in techno, you know, you're doing this. And, you know, it's, we spend a lot of time like talking to users, interviewing and, you know, taking all the feedback from all the forums. If we don't, even if we don't reply on those forums, we're always lurking and watching, I think so. Yeah, and everybody has an opinion too, right? So I'm sure there's all kinds of features that maybe like are good ideas, but is not gonna necessarily enhance the product for ever, for the larger user base, so. Yeah, I, I, I think I remember early on, like with uh, Gerhard, our, our CEO, he, he had and founder, he was like, I was writing these like novel emails, like this is the way life should work. And, you know, and he's like, you know, a good wish fits in the subject line. And that like, that changed how I do things. Cause you know, like mm. break it down to one thing that you want. And, and we, fo we focus everything as user goals, try not to do the solution before you figure out the problem and that kind of thing. But yeah, at the same time, we love diving into solving the problems too. So. Well, maybe we can jump into some of those those things. I'm just going to like run through some of these notes. I actually posted a poll on Instagram and asked people questions that they wanted to ask you. Oh, sweet. So we can definitely dive into some of those as we go. But even backing up, let's definitely get to the push. But with the APC40 um, and the original, what was your role specifically with helping design that? I'm curious. I think like, so Glenn brought something that was like the the five by eight clip matrix and faders and some uh, like track mixing buttons. And that was great. And we were all like, yeah, we, we want it. Let's do it. And, but then there were some things on the side, like uh, he had, a, I think an XY pad, which works in Ableton, but it's not super integrated in Ableton and all the devices. So we, we were thinking like, how can we make this better for like all devices? And 
whether it's a VST or a any of Live's devices. And so like a lot of the like device navigation sends and effects r- routing, should it have a crossfader, these, you know, these kinds of things. And I was influenced a lot by my live set, which is like eight to 12 tracks with lots of scenes. And, you know, how do we bank around? Should it move? There's, you know, endless debates on whether it should default to banking or moving one by one. So we had, you know, like lots of little tiny design questions around that stuff. And then, and you make mistakes too, like, you know, in hardware, once you, that day of like finalizing the silk screen on the buttons is like, it takes forever. Should it go here? Should it go there? Yeah. You know, before that, it's not quite set in stone. And then, and then you can't really go back once you've, you've decided something's not the way you want it. I mean, I think the first one was great and really like, well, actually like the feel of the first one better than the second one. I think the second one though, we were able to fix some of those things like by putting some of the things on the tracks themselves rather than like all over on the right hand side. Like we had the the sends are now aligned with the with each track, which was a lot easier. Yeah, I was a big fan of that too. That was a nice upgrade. The A B button to another one, you know, for crossfader and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. So just to clarify, the MK2 of the APC forty, was that also a collaboration with Ableton or I thought that was an Akai thing only? No, that was a collaboration with them as well. Okay, so. okay, good to know. I thought it was otherwise. The new one is is the, is just them, I think. But but we we do the scripting in house, so there's some back and forth, but it's not quite as as um, collaborative of a design. But I think everybody kind of knows where it's going at this point. So I'm I'm excited to try it. Yeah, honestly, I haven't heard much about the the Mark III with the APC40. I know there's the 64 that just came out. I'm sorry. That's what I. That's what I meant. Yeah, the 64. Yeah. Okay, I've heard quite a few mixed reviews about the uh, touch faders. There's something for me about just being able to touch a fader and be able to control that and grab it and cut in and out really fast on the fly. And I've heard that from a lot of people. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes with future gen models. Yeah, with faders, it's like a. It's it's tough because like you want. You want motorized faders, you want like DJ faders, and but you would also love them to be like reset. And like I see where they're going with like touch strips because you can you can reset the values and all that stuff, changing tracks and all that, which is great. Yeah, the perfect one doesn't exist yet, I think. Right. And, and I hear it for push too. Like people are like, oh, I wish it had faders. I do too, but then it's going to be like, you know, a commandment uh, block of stone or so, you know, like how, how tall do you want it to be? So, um, that's true. That makes sense. Yeah, I think the original APC40, one of my favorite things is how durable it was. I feel like I could throw it off a bridge and it would be just fine. Um, the second one has more of a plasticky kind of feel, so it feels maybe not as sturdy. I would agree. I guess the, their intention was to make the faders more durable by recessing them. Mm. And, and that works, but at the same time, they don't feel quite as good as the first one, in my opinion, too. Yeah, It's missing some of that like solid metal feel of the, uh, of the first one. This episode is sponsored by Baby Audio. They create some really fantastic instruments and plugins, and they just released a big update to their cult classic, the BA-1 synth, that includes an all-new separate effects strip plugin based on its 80s-inspired effects section. If you already own the synth, get the upgrade for free. Right now, you can get 51% off new downloads for this new intro sale. And if you use the code AMP15, which is in the show notes of this episode, you get an additional 15% off. So this is a great deal to take advantage of right now. Once again, check out the show notes, use the discount code AMP15, give it a listen for yourself, and a huge thanks to Baby Audio for supporting this podcast. Yeah, it seems the crossfader is also a lot more sensitive and breakable on this on the Mark II. Kiva, who's the Ableton certified trainer, who taught APC40, he's like one of the best APC users I know. He was saying that the crossfader on the Mark II was soldered differently than on the first one, and so it's not easily replaceable, um, which was interesting as well. Yeah, I remember it was a big deal on the first one to have it uh, use have it be a replaceable fader because I think we were. Also working with this company that, you know, they, they don't just do a Kai, they do Newmark and Alesis and like, so they have, they have a lot of experience doing DJ stuff and now they're rain and mm. even more than that. So, um, in music is like a lot of different companies in one. Yeah. Do you foresee, or do you know, or maybe you can't even say, uh, like a Mark three coming out for the APC 40. Have you heard anything about 
I, I don't know anything about it. Sorry, I, I misspoke. I was talking about the 64. I okay. Just, I just mixed it up. Yeah, I'd be curious to see what that looks like. They discontinued the Mark II, so now it's a supply thing. That's be interesting. Oh, yeah. I think another one that, that I like, or I don't have it, but I, I'd like to get one, is the uh, launch control, um, which I think is, is really a great pairing with Bush, too. Yes. Yeah, I've heard great things. I see things. a lot of people doing, like, dub dub style like sends and stuff like on it and um and yeah and they they uh you know a couple of these control surfaces or like a dozen of them auto map to push in standalone so they just work you know which is yeah maybe not even wasn't even planned by us it's just by the way we did it it happened to work out yeah it'll be interesting to see what the future of the apc40 looks like well speaking of push which I think there's a lot we could talk about around that alone. Do you have the patent? I saw on your LinkedIn as I was stalking you that you have, like there was a dynamic diatonic instrument patent around the push. I think that was like 2014 or something, or earlier than that, it was like 2000. Yeah, um, other companies had done the the like isomorphic grid of fourths, you know, like the Linstrument is a, is a really good example. And um, and a great uh, inspiration, Roger Lin's a great inspiration and all the things he's done from the instrument to the NPC to um, the Lindrum. And I, I'm glad I've gotten to know him over the years too. And he's just a really nice guy to talk to and give advice to. So awesome. He also won like, he has like platinum albums for writing songs for Eric Clapton before he did any of this. Yeah. He's, he's a wild guy. So that's awesome. Uh, yeah. The patent is on basically taking that, that grid of that's chromatic and turning it into an in key, the in key mode, basically. So while we were playing around with it, that was like an aha moment that was like, oh, it seems like somebody should have done this, but nobody had done it. And, and, you know, I still play in chromatic mode a lot because I'm a trained guitarist, but yeah. then in key is great too, just for like getting out of your, um, getting creative and getting into different, different areas of music that you wouldn't think of. And with push three, it's like, it's, I'm using it even more than ever now because of uh, because of the bending. Like when you bend now um, on the in key mode on push, it might be a half step or a whole step, but you're gonna you get wild sounds when you bend from chord to chord because they're not bending linearly. Probably could patent that too if we wanted to, but patents are just sort of paper at the end of the day, you know, unless you really want to spend a lot of money on defending it. But yeah. And we've let we've let lots of other people do it now too, the in key mode and things like that because. I'm, I guess we're of the opinion, or at least I am, of that like all the competition is great, you know, and it just makes for better products all around. And I don't like, I don't expect anybody to have one brand of gear on their desk either, you know, like, and you'll see that in our photography. At, like, I don't, I have everything, you know, yeah. and, and and I don't, I think there's a totally a place for like these products to live together. Like, I can see that. You know, the new MPC 37 would be great with Bush standalone as two standalone linked devices. Awesome. Use it all. No, that makes perfect sense. And it even shows with the design of the Push 3 as well, because now you can have mini in and out. So you can, you know, add additional controllers. Like you mentioned, the APC is a great marriage with the Push. You could expand that with your setup easily and have everything running in the Push. You know, what's a great setup with it is um, what I've got here is... Uh, M8UX, I think, the ESI. And it, if you use a class-compliant MIDI device with Push Standalone, then it just works. And so I have that hooked up to, like, I don't know how many synths I've gotten here. I've lost count. Um, Interesting. And the cool thing about it is it switch when you switch from, like, control mode to standalone, all of those things go with it. So, like, I can be on my computer triggering all my external synthesizers, and then I can go back to standalone and it'll just route the MIDI right over to it. Yeah, that's beautiful. But the, the point I was getting to, though, was um, uh, it's really brought, the MPE on the pads, too, has brought a lot of these old synths to light in ways that I was really surprised by. Like, Because, you know, not like, I, let's say I have this Fender Chroma Polaris over here, which is like an old poly synth um, designed by ARP, and then Fender bought ARP. It's nothing like a Rhodes. I have a Rhodes over here, but but it's it's poly aftertouch and even the key bed on it isn't. So you can't really like, you never would know it's poly aftertouch, but we've got a max for live device that the MPE control device, which I can change the slide on my push to poly aftertouch. Mm. So now I'm playing this like synth from 1981 expressively and like 
it's wild. And old rack mounts since like the Oberheim Matrix or the Roland stuff, like you can make those into like MP kind of synths. That's really cool. Same same thing with like a um I've got a a Pro One here that is the keys are notoriously bad on them and they, they died on mine. And so it's just a module now. Mm. That is like it's always been cantankerous old always being repaired and uh now i set send the cv gate and filter out of push into that and i could bend and slide in in key on push in ways that i never could with the original synth and play that filter with your finger instead of like one hand on the key one hand on the filter that's really wild to see how this is like working with gear that is ancient you know that's a great reminder for people to like use the MPE or the sensitivity of the pads on the push to control outboard gear. You know, even if they already have keys, you can get really expressive and just like running it, controlling other gear as like a brain for the sounds and then use the expressivity of the push. Yeah, I think one thing that like for me that is maybe also surprising about having it standalone, like I was like, okay, great in the hotel on stage on the couch, you know, I'm really excited to have the standalone. But what I didn't realize was just having it in my regular place in my studio next to all my gear and turning off the computer. And I think I saw this um I saw this little clip from the the writer Neil Gaiman the other day that was like he was talking about how he does books and he's like, well I write I write books now with a with a pen and pad because nobody can email me when I'm doing that. And I'm not like four hours later on eBay. And that is really like become a powerful workflow for me. Turn the computer completely off. And I'm not like, oh, did I update my VSTs? And uh, oh, wait, what's this guy saying on KVR? Oh, yeah. you know, I, oh, I get, well, let me check on Instagram. Oh, it's bedtime. You know, now, now I'm really focusing on standalone with all the gear attached. And it's like, man, it gets you into a, a groove. So. Yeah, there's something about connecting the flow state when you're not distracted. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I mean, there's been times my mom has called me and then like FaceTime rings through my computer as I'm like producing, you know, versus yeah. if I was just focused on just the push and nothing else. Like, I feel like it, you're more in the zone while you're creating. Yeah. And that's something we talk about, like in for live for push is like flow it definitely is like really important. And that's what push is all about. I mean, that that's really the, if anything gets you out of that, it's with something we want to look at and try to fix. And there's tons of things that it doesn't do yet that we want it to do, but like really getting that, getting workflows to be as fast as possible is something we focus on. I know there's, I know people, there's tons of things we can do to make it faster, but, uh, but we're trying, you know, like that's our goal and goal. Yeah, I mean, it's new. There's going to be firmware updates and things like that. I've been telling people who have experienced some bugs along the way when it first released. And I'm like, you know, that's like any product, especially a new product like this, like new to market. It's not like really anything else. Um, so there's going to be updates. There's going to be things you're going to keep supporting. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was, yeah, a little rocky at the beginning, but this was like a seven or eight year project, I think. Because, I mean, the first two years were rewriting the push to code, which we needed to like clean up. Mm. Then we were like porting live to Linux to work on a small computer, you know, and cleaning it up, writing our own operating system. So like none of that is like user facing. It's all just under the hood stuff and years, years of work. And MP, the pads took the whole time because it's a new way of sensing that we're doing that no one's done before. Yeah, it's really very finely sensitive. We have a lot more we can do with these pads if we want to along the way. Yeah. And we do that like our definitely our plan. That's why we made it user upgradable. Like this is going to be around for a long time and we're going to see a lot of things going into it. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, majority of that right now is going into like the things that feel like they might be missing from live because really it's like it's live running in there under the hood. And there's just like, you know, how many preferences or features are there in live? We don't support them all and we want to get the ones that make sense into there. And that, that may keep us away from some bigger things at times because there's a lot of little things to do. But then we have like we have a lot of creative ideas for how we want to use the pads and what other things we can add to it and visualizations and that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's exciting. If you just had to name drop a couple of things, what are your favorite new features from two to push three? It's uh expressive pads and, and standalone, you know, like those are the two. But the like 
the things that come with that had to be there for standalone. That was like our our work. I mean, I've summed it up to uh, to people in the company that like we basically were building preferences for two years because we had to like, hey, you got to connect MIDI, you need Wi Fi, you need uh, ADAT, you need an audio interface. Like we were, we had to just do all this under the hood stuff before we could get to the creative stuff. And that connectivity, I really love the the ADAT. I love a lot because um, mm-hmm. I have an ADAT expander here, and that's like that also switches when I go to standalone. So like I have the MIDI going out, and I have the audio coming in from all my keyboards, clavinet, Rhodes, string machines, synthesizers, and that's all comes with me when I go to standalone. And then I have another ADAT expander in the basement with my drum kit, and I can. I can just bring push down as my multi-track recorder. All the mics are set up. And uh, so that's that's really cool. There's there's eight ADA inputs, is that right? Yeah, would, depending on what interface you had, you had eight, in, eight ins, eight outs. I've got a uh, okay. Audient Evo SP8. I, I really like it a lot. It's a good price, really clean. Yeah, but so that connectivity is like, is really awesome for a, for a synth hoarder like me and a guitarist and bassist and all these things yeah i was really stoked about the adat um because i'm a drummer so if i wanted to record now i can have like eight microphones to track uh into push if i wanted and then play that back real quick which is really fun yeah i mean it it could also be like it's a lot of things it could just be your multi-track recorder you know it's not yeah so different from my four track my yamaha mt 120 four track i had in the 80s you know like it's uh uh except for way way more powerful you know Mm mm-hmm yeah what uh what are maybe some push three features that people may not know about something that's not really obvious i think the um something we worked hard on and was uh to get going was to get this the new auto warping which came with 11.3 yeah that for as a sampler like i love it and it caused us some bugs at the beginning which was for live but it was really essential for me for push because if we didn't have manual warp markers then we needed something to make the auto warping really work and i think in the past it worked well on like stuff made with the metronome in techno but it didn't work on like the old jazz funk that i sample and the new auto warping is like man it's like i calculated how much time i spend warping and per week and i calculated that it's going to save two months of my life oh wow uh, you know, because it's just like it works, and finally, yeah, it actually it's easier to do on push than in live. You just go to clip view, press edit, press uh, warp to grid, and it's done. And then we don't have that control in live for some reason, but um, but uh, that and then you can like you chop the samples with Simpler, and now Simpler is also uses MPE, so you can you can like hit a sample, slide to a different pitch. It doesn't without retriggering it and change the sample change the sample pitch while it's playing. You can do weird, wild stuff that you couldn't do with samples before. And the jog wheel is really fast for me. I, I love it. We designed yeah. it ourselves, which is a theme you might hear, <laughs> you know, like we, uh, cause we didn't see anything that was like solid enough for us, you know? So we designed our, our head of hardware engineering, Oliver Harms is like really brilliant. And he, he designed many things on this. And I mean, in particular, What's most impressive is that it's thinner than Push 2, but it's got a battery, computer, hard drive, and audio interface inside of it. So That's impressive how much you compacted into that thing. Yeah, and I, I mean, especially a lot of it's thanks to this like this really incredible uh, compute module inside of it that's made was made by Intel. Now it's Asus makes it. Um, that's uh, it's tiny and and real really fast. So hmm. especially because it's not running like. Adobe Illustrator and you know uh, Chrome and other things that would take it up. It's got it's just like live. That's what I do. Yeah, it would be fun to add like Minesweeper or like other old games in it. You could like play games on the push. That would actually be pretty fun. We always have wishes for that. I think the best example of that was I think the Serato SL one had a, had a secret key command where you could use the turntables to play Pong. Oh, nice. You know, like each one is a paddle. That's and awesome. I was always jealous of that. So. <laughs> well, maybe someday. Yeah. Maybe, maybe a maybe. firmware update coming soon. That'd be cool. Are there uh, additional capabilities that you wish you could have integrated into Push 3 that just maybe weren't possible yet? Um, I think I have to plead the fifth on that because they will be possible soon, I think so. Okay. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, but hardware wise, I think it's it's nice to be at like version three for this to be our standalone one because you know there were learnings about layouts and things from push one to push two. Uh, and we always we always wanted push to be standalone from the beginning, and uh, like it just was like, what chunk can we bite off to make a product in a certain amount of time? I mean, uh, the first one took I think like two years, and then two years to the second one, and then seven or eight years to this one. So you can I think it was a good move to get those other two out first, you know, before yeah we got to the point. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it was a huge jump seeing the jump from two to three. I mean, it's a pretty huge leap between each controller. Uh, I wouldn't even compare them to being the same controller necessarily. They're so different in a lot of ways. Yeah. The menu to the layout, to the pads, to all the things. I love the look of the uh, Push 1 display. Like, I mean, I wouldn't go back to it because, you know, of what I have now. But that, like, cool old LCD display was, was like a gold, a great look. And we, I mean, there we wanted samples and stuff, but it was too expensive and too hard for us to commit to like drawing on a display, which is where then when Push 2 came, we had time to do that. That was the next big jump for us was to start doing these sample displays and device faces. And I love the design of the device faces like Echo and Hybrid Reverb and these things. Like we have a lot of fun, I think, and great graphic designers to do like really cute but understandable um uh, icons and and little uh ways for you to see what's going on yeah i mean i like we love we love the stuff teenage engineering does too like i mean it's uh, those are we know those guys and it's it's that stuff's awesome too i think very playful they make some incredible products too Cool. Well, so as far as push three, um, I know that there were some issues with some of the supply chain during COVID and how that Im- impacted product development it was probably a journey. Do you, do you feel like some of that has been like resolved or out of the way? Yeah, I mean, it was there was incredible stress for a lot of that stuff because we're you know we're pretty low on the on the chain of who's going to get it we're in competition with like car windows, you know, like for yeah. some microcontroller that, and we have a lot of specific things inside it for the pads and things like that, that were, that take years, years of planning to get them. And then COVID came and was like, actually, we need to know now how many you're going to need in two years. And <laughs> will you be done with the product by then? You know, and yeah, and that's been a, a real challenge still can be a challenge, but it's much better now than it was. But yeah, so we're we're fighting to get them from the the automobile windows, and they're fighting to get them from the cell phones. We're pretty low on the on the chain of who's going to because we're not buying in the numbers that a car or a phone is, you know. Right. So there were specific components, and we have people who that's their job is to like procure parts, and that that's that's all they have to do, and it's a lot. Yeah. Plan ahead to make the financial investments. And in particular, our our display and our uh, processor are quite, they're very expensive and they've had their rocky uh, procurement times, but everything's kind of settled now finally, which is, which is good. Yeah. But it was hard, you know, because also you can't go to China. We couldn't go to China for a long time during that. And we had to, we like made a fake assembly line in our Berlin office just to like practice how we were going to do it, like what kind of. We build a lot of our own tools and stuff to like, we have this awesome kind of like, uh, looks like a torture typewriter or something that is for testing the pad velocity. And like each row goes down with weights and make sure that they're all like calibrated exactly right and stuff like that. So interesting. Yeah, I can imagine that was quite the process, especially creating a brand new product from scratch like that. And there's so much involved. I'm glad to hear that it made it through and you know, still creating the push three and there's going to be a lot more to be made. And I've heard really good feedback and I'm really excited to see the new updates and and things with the three. So as far as live 12 goes, uh, do you have any favorite updates with live 12 that like really stand out that as it relates to the push three? I think my, my favorite parts of my favorite thing in live 12 is probably the mixer and arrangement view. It's like, yeah, like I, once it's there, it's like, Oh, why wasn't this always here? This is great. Yep. Um, but that has nothing to do with push. And really a lot of what we did at first for push on 12 was just getting it to make sure it worked and to like make sure the update could happen. So there's a lot of like not 
maybe the most exciting, but super necessary things, authorization, you know, all this kind of stuff that you have to do to make it work. I like Roar and Meld are probably like the devices that come. They have really yes. nice interfaces for them. You know, the earlier devices Push wasn't around for, so they weren't really designed with that in mind. But now, like anytime we do a synth or a effect, they they have a push next to them. They're like thinking while they're designing it, how will this work on push? And our like modulation matrixes and like how you assign MPE in them is all like really well thought out, super easy compared to older devices, which we had to sort of bolt it onto. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I like those devices. Like Roar surprised me in that it's like my main use case for it is on bass guitar, which is not really what it's for, but I just realized it's a betterizer. Like I was like, anytime I use this, my bass guitar sounds better. Yeah. So uh, now I have to use it. I feel that for pretty much anything I put it on, to be honest, drums, whatever it is, yeah. like a cowbell, it's going to slap way harder. It's and uh, I love <laughs> I love the modulation matrix the whole layout that Ableton has consistently added to like meld or like starting in wavetable. Um, I love, I love that modulation matrix and even including that in the audio effect like meld is just really, it's nice because it's a consistent design and I feel like it makes it easier for people to start to learn um, how to do any kind of modulation inside of a device itself. Like in roar, you can map the envelope to whatever you want and make stuff really like dynamic with the distortion, which is really cool. Roar for the win. I'm a big fan. Yeah, actually, I was just this morning doing a video on like how to assign like MPE to all our different instruments and on push and in live because it's different on a lot of them. You know, it's like, I, I like the consistency of the new ones, but like, how do I do it in sampler? And how does it work in, you know, uh, analog? It's all different. And that's so why I was making a quick video just to, you know, have something to refer to when people ask. That's great. Yeah, I would love to see that video too. Cool, man. Uh, any other thoughts? Yeah. Go ahead. That brings me to another like favorite small feature on Push 3 is we have this automatic note pitch mode, which is great. Because, you know, when we first set it up, we're doing like pitch bend on everything. And, you know, you have each finger independently pitch bending notes and that's great, but then I'm like playing a Rhodes or a clavinet preset, and I'm like, Bong. no, I don't want my piano to be like bendy, yeah. unless I do. Um, but I definitely wanted to have it so that we could have like a glissando of notes, like like you're hitting all the white keys or something on a, on a piano. And uh, so we have this automatic mode that basically like does it the old way. If pitch bend is off, and then if, if uh, uh, MPE note uh, pitch bend is on, then it'll bend. So you can do it either way, and what it, the presets can save it too. So that's the nice. right kind of instruments. It's just subtle, but it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense, you know. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I love that. Yeah, and easier for people who don't know how to turn that kind of stuff on and off. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So as far as push three, is the performance pack in twelve also? Does that also work on the push three? I haven't tried it yet. Actually, I can't say so. Um, but I need. Yeah, I just haven't gotten to it. Sure, I've been. I have tried the thing I really love is the sound oracle packs. So these are like, um, he's a producer in uh, Atlanta and, uh, and a sound designer. He did all a lot of Timbaland and Justin Timberlake stuff. And I mean, he, who's who of hip hop uh, he's done drum sounds for. Great guy. He's become a good friend. And it, he was like, hey, I want to do some sounds for live. I, do, I want more like authentic hip hop in there. And, and he did this golden era and trap trap sound i love that pack i've been playing with it a lot it's really designed with push and with you know like him and i going back and forth on what we could do with it and um he did some really creative things that i hadn't thought of to do i do a lot of expressive drums myself and making you know making it so you can hit the different articulations of a hi-hat and he did it in a in a different way that does it globally on the kit which i couldn't even figure out how he mapped it at first and he did this like wild geeky trick to like map all notes to the mpe control and then it like it's 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 almost like having an mpe choke for pad and uh interesting so if you play it on push it really comes alive on push three really okay see i haven't played it on push three but it's totally different yeah because you you play if you play higher on one pad it adds like different effects to the whole kit and then but they'll choke each other off and 
awesome. It's, it's wild. So it's like classic hip hop, but also innovative, you know, which is, I want to do more with him. He's great. Yeah. The sounds alone in the pack, I was really happy with. Um, and also, I just love, I love the ability to do the uh, uh, similar sounds too, to be able to swap kits or individual samples and things like that. I think that's also a game changer just to be able to do that on the fly. Yeah, totally. And we, we don't have that on push yet, but th- those are the kind of things that, and the, the browser filtering, those are things that like, of course we want to have and we have a long list uh, i don't i can't give any promises as to anything when anything comes but we want it all to work eventually you know i guess it's just yeah. like what and we have to weigh i think a painful thing for us right now is that we have to weigh like there's all these new things in 12 but then like push is still like behind live five in some ways you know so we have to think about like ah we don't have grooves on there yet how do you weigh grooves versus uh transformations you know like which what comes first? There's so many different things we want to do, and mm-hmm. it's we're still we are, we play catch up to live a lot. I think too, because sure. they're coming with new features, and we have to like we have to do the things that make standalone make sense on its own, but then also add the new features that come from live. Yeah, and I you know I no guarantees that we get it all, but we're that's you know that's where we're we want it all. That's for sure. sure. We want everything everybody else wants too. Yeah. Well, and that that was kind of my assumption too when I first played with the Push Three is that there's now that it's basically a computer in itself, there's a lot of firmware options. I would imagine as far as updating. Yeah, I mean, what I mean, the pads are like so sensitive; we can sense between them, and we could do so much creative stuff with that. And Max for Live may be a big part of that too, like how mm. how we take over the pads, how we could what we could do there. Mm-hmm. Then the display is is also like you know we have our sort of fixed way it works you know of like the devices and track selection but we can draw whatever we want onto there it's a really high end display which was a story in itself how we found it it's hard to find displays in that size we were looking couldn't find anything and back then we weren't really like hey we want a custom display let's spend millions of dollars to get yeah. a custom yeah. display so we we had to hope there was something out there and it turned out that Gerhardt was driving a rental car and saw this display on the dashboard and was like, I was driving this model car. I think I saw it. And it turned out it was the same width as the push one pads. Oh, wow. So we were like, this is meant to be, uh, you know, shout out to that car manufacturer, whoever that was. That's awesome. Yeah. It's also on a, a kitchen stove too, I think. So those are the <laughs> push a stove and the car, I think are the customers that's, for that. That's amazing. I love that. Yeah, another thing about the Push 3 that I thought was interesting, I don't know if this is even possible with a firmware update, is to be able to do d- direct monitoring would be nice. Uh, and I, maybe there is a way to do it that I haven't found. But being able to just use the sound card without having to monitor in a track would be really cool. Just, you could plug in and just play out your guitar if you wanted to through the outputs or whatever. Yeah, I, I'm a, I mean, I'm a guitarist. I I'm totally see the need. And, you know, like there's all these great modeling pedals out there, too, that you could like put your Universal Audio or your uh, Strymon amp modeler ahead in, in before it. Definitely want that myself. That's all I can say. Just do that tomorrow. <laughs> Just finish it tomorrow. Yeah. It's easy. <laughs> all right. Uh, Ralph, you just need to... Uh, yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot of guitarists over here. So, like, yeah, we, we hear you loud and clear. I mean, to be honest, that's one of my favorite things about 12 is the new, um, in each track, keep latency, turning that off is, that has been one of my flags I've been waving for many years to, mm-hmm. to get rid of that. Because it works for some people, but not for me. And like, yeah. well, I feel the guitar, I don't need that added latency. So that that's a total changer for me, so. Yeah, I just did a live 12 presentation and I, I, there's a huge amount of people at that workshop that were really excited about the latency update. It's a really great. Yeah, I mean, there were like Macs for live devices to work around it and stuff and like move yeah. your audio after you recorded it. And I'm like, no, no, we need, we just need to do this. And that, that was really important for push too, because you can't nudge it afterwards. You know, like it, it's not easy to, you know, maybe you could, but it, like that's a pain. So yeah. like, that's huge for me. Yeah, same. So speaking of Live 12, I want to respect your time too. If you could only choose, say, three audio effects, three MIDI effects, and three instruments to use the rest of your life, what would they be? Good question. So I just got this um, Max for Live device uh, called Loader, which is um, Decap from, you know, Drums That Knock. He told me about it. And it's like, uh, 
it's made by somebody, one of our forum moderators, uh, Julian. And he, um, so loader is like 12 slots, I think. And you can, uh, you can drag any, uh, any preset into it or even a VST if it's in a rack. And then you just press that button and it loads it. And what does, I didn't realize how that would, how much that would affect me. Cause I'm, I'm kind of a, like, I load the, I load my default and then tweak it kind of guy. I'm not, I use presets too. I mean, it's, it's here or there, you know? Um, but what this made me do was say, what are my 12 favorite devices that I want to have in my template set? Mm. And now you can MIDI map that you can key map it. And like, actually I just took it on my, my numeric keypad and put some, uh, put some tape on it, uh, you know, some, uh, label maker on it now. And now oh, nice. whatever track I'm on, I just press reverb and I got reverb. So that's really cool. Yeah. That kind of reminds me of shortcut buddy. If you've ever used shortcut buddy max for live device. No, it's probably, yeah. Similar thing. So three instruments, and three audio effects. And in, yeah, yeah. In MIDI. Okay. So, um, I'd probably trade my MIDI effects for, uh, audio effects if I could, um, like but, Pokemon uh, cards. Gotta go simpler just for the creative mangling of samples and things like that. Um, yeah. And I gotta go sampler because <laughs> of, especially now that I'm on, now that I'm on standalone, I'm using a lot more packs because that's, you know, VSDs don't work on it. Mm-hmm. And I'm really digging some of the stuff we have there, like the electric keyboards or like, there's even like, there's a set multi sample of the Nova Chord, which is like the earliest polyphonic synthesizer from 1945 we made with tubes yeah and now i made i set that up to be mpe sensitive so it's like i mean like things that couldn't be possible you know mm-hmm. where i have my multi-sampled roads and i'm using i have a tremolo per note with the mpe or a wawa on each note of a clavinet you know like things that sound natural but aren't possible or not unless you had 88 uh tremolos and 88 wawas you know um yeah so th- i'm really digging that stuff things that sound like real but aren't in, aren't in in existence so those are two though now i need a third synthesizer i'm glad you're not asking about my hardware synthesizers because that's a harder <laughs> question, I think. yeah that's a black hole for a lot of people and i have a little modular stuff here but i know that that's like a that's like a no no i need to blacklist that site because i'm not i'm just not getting into that I mean, I have fun with it, but I mean, right now, what I have is a, uh, I have a four voice MPE capable, like each, each four note is, is its own synth and they, they round robin to which one plays and I could bend them all. And it's like, that's awesome. It's a great waste of time and money. <laughs> and, you know, everything I do with the modular, I'm like, that was fun. And it sounds, that's the worst thing I've ever made. I'm sticking to my poly synths more than that. Makes sense. The, who's my what's my third one wave table analog and drift i guess yeah and i haven't tried i haven't used meld enough to know actually if that how that would sit in there and actually i love operator too i mean i love operator me too yeah but i'd probably go with one of the like wave table can get a lot of these sounds and has of the other ones and has the the great like moog filter in it and stuff like that so yeah it, it, and you can import your own wave in it too so yeah i've been putting like oberheim stuff in there and like i've downloading other people's wavetables and stuff it's like yeah you can do really cool stuff and i love that wavetable position with push slide yes going through harmonics of things and stuff like that that's really cool okay, so that, that's three instruments the devices are hybrid reverb for sure i mean i'm just love i love it me it's too like also just putting us like having a spring reverb now like for my guitar amps and things like that is is great yes four is easy it's like the bread and butter is echo eq reverb and compression but i love my drum bus utility i use all the time yeah you know i guess i can go without echo if i've got hybrid reverb um so i'm gonna i guess i'm gonna go eq and compression I yeah think. you listed you listed all of mine too yeah glue compressor it's definitely a big one too i love that I like the I like glue, but I also like the other one just for the visual of it. It like really taught me about compression actually, like seeing that that display of like what's what's hitting and what's not. Yeah, that's true. It is nice to have the different views to actually see like how the envelope is shaped with the compressor. Yeah. Also, it's interesting. Um 
and maybe maybe this is something you can't speak to, but I'm curious, uh, the update between the Live 8 compressor and then the newer compressor, I believe that um, they like redesigned in 9 or 10, notice like the functionality and the way you sidechain with the feed forward modeling ff1 is is different than the regular peak on the compressor um and they kind of interact different with side chaining i don't know if you've heard anything internally about that or if you could speak to that i haven't uh because i'm not in that those teams so much um but yeah. i but i do notice that i don't ever use peak on that compressor i use rms because it sounds better to me and i don't I don't know why I would think like I would assume I would want peak, but for some reason it clicks a little bit for me or something. It doesn't, yeah. doesn't get the same smoothness as RMS. So that's where I, that's where I go with it. Yeah. But I use a lot of other compressors too. Like I, I like a 1176 and a yeah. LA2A and, and just any, just messing around with anything, other people's presets, seeing what happens, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah. I mean, MIDI effects. You didn't say MIDI yet. That's right. So um, I guess, MPE control, definitely. Like that mm. for me now is like letting me do a lot of stuff with like, like the OB6 didn't quite respond to push the way I wanted it to. It was more like linear. That lets me get the right curve for it um, and do some really interesting sound design uh, and probably expression control too. Cause now I can map. I mean, this is all very push biased, but hey, I'm the, the person who should be most biased towards push, I guess. Expression control, I can do things like map operator you know, map things to operators. So I have like operators, not MP capable other than pitch, but I can at least do like overtones with, with MP and, and I use operator a lot for baseline. So mm. that's good enough for me. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, and then, yeah, I don't use cord. I don't use, it might be just like pitch or velocity. Those are the ones they're like bread and butter stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and there's like a scale awareness built into those now, which is really cool. Yeah. I guess my music changes keys too much to use the scale aware stuff, I think is is one challenge I have with it. But it's um but uh, you can definitely create a lot of stuff. And I, I have to try it more with like the scale aware stuff on meld, I think is really interesting. Mm. And like how you can have the oscillators follow as a, a key and things like that. Do you know if the learn function on, say, like the chord or these other scale aware effects is possible to enable on the push three? Is that a thing? I don't believe so uh, yet. No. Okay. I, know. I was just curious. I had somebody ask. I didn't know. Yeah. One thing, tunings is, is also really interesting and I think enables a lot of people to make, who like, especially in like Arabic music styles, to make music that they weren't really able to do easily in yep. live you can't set it on push at the moment but you can you can, if you have a live set in a tuning system you can bring it on to push and it'll work so that's kind of like our you know i mean that's kind of our escape card in some ways right now with push like you know you can't midi map on it because that's that's a big deal for design for us like how would you do it and like how do you access all these interfaces and um besides just the actual like midi mapping of it but you can MIDI map into a live set on your computer, bring that over to push, and uh, and it works. So that that's cool for like a, if you want one of those faders on your APC forty to be on a specific device or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's pretty much how it's always been, really, until the standalone. Anyway, so I mean, just yeah. like, just a little extra step. Uh, one quick question: You did mention VSTs, and maybe this is something you can't answer, but I've, I'm sure you've heard this from people. Will it ever be possible? Is it in Ableton's interest to have VSTs be able to be played on a push someday, knowing that it's basically a computer? Is that of any interest? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I want people to be able to do use whatever they want to use. I guess it's a real it's a real challenge though, in that yeah. every VST has first of all, the VST has to be Linux compatible. And that's okay. So now we've reduced it to some number of companies. But there are a lot that are, and um, but then next you have like, how do I authorize it? And like, you know, like mm. it would really be like us having to work with each company one by one to get their stuff to work. Yeah, I'm not going to say it's out of the question. It's definitely not, and it's something I hear as like a really high wish that people want, and also some of our famous users are want that too. You know, like who use particular VSTs, they have to have. You know. 
So, uh, yeah, I, I hear it loud and clear. I just have to, we have to think about how we would do it if we did, you know? Sure. Yeah. And once again, that goes back to everybody has an opinion. There's so much feedback I'm sure you guys get on a regular basis. And it's just a matter of filtering and, and making it happen, which is not a small task. No, it's not. It's not. And but we have a we have a good system now, I guess. Like we have a user researcher who takes um, everything from every channel and it all funnels into one like database. So we can we can really see like or we're starting to see like what what goes the highest. And we also have our center code forum, which is like wishes can get upvoted. So we know what people want. You have to balance it, I think, with like, well, what kind of users on a center code forum in the first place is that? representative of everybody else and yeah i think it's not necessarily but it's a definitely a big um a big part of it and being able to see that priority it's not so different from place to place you know although i do find it quite different from like europe to america like it's the the techno versus like pop rock uh, hip-hop has different sets of wishes and i think it's quite different what people like sequencing you know i see is more and pattern generation is much more of a, generally speaking, more I see in Europe and like playing drums with your hands more in the U.S. But it's, uh, I mean, obviously there's examples of both yeah. in both places. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, even going back to the tunings, I feel like Push 3 is opening itself to a whole another market that maybe has been excluded from like the traditional Western scale. Um, now that yeah. there's, you know, like you mentioned Arabic tuning systems that can you know, could be possible now in live. It's huge to open up to a whole new world um, of people who maybe didn't have the ability or the technology to make music in yeah, that I'm, sense. I'm excited. There's a new website we just put out, like tuning, I think it's tuning.ableton.com that talks like, go. it's deep. I mean, deep essays about all kinds of tunings. I've just started it, but it's uh, the, the learning team that does these other p pages we have. It's really awesome stuff. With musical examples, you can play, export, all that kind of thing. So. I'm excited to check that out and like try out more of the non-equal temperament stuff. That's that's exciting to be like hearing like harmonic series stuff out there. So no, me too. I, I saw Dennis DeSantis posted that the other day. I've I've yet to check it out. He's gonna be on the podcast soon. Oh sweet. He's he's a good old friend. We worked in the New York office for a long time. So he, that's who I was shouting out there for sure. He's brilliant and his great book too, yeah. Yeah, 74 Creative Strategies. It's a fantastic yeah. book. It's one of those timeless books. Um, it's released a while ago. Love that. Up there with the the, the Brian Eno uh, cards, you know, like those are the two, yeah. like, get me out of a rut uh, sources. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, Dennis is, is great. I'm excited to actually meet him for the first time. So that'll be fun. Awesome, man. Uh, real quick, as far as your music and your projects um, that you have with... Um, uh, Jethro, and then how do you pronounce it? Countic or Countach? Countach, okay. Like the Lamborghini, yeah. Nice. Is that what you drive? Um, <laughs> yeah, not quite. Subaru, yeah, um, yeah. Countach, I do with my buddy Brian, who's who's at Ableton as well, and he's a gr a great singer and multi instrumentalist. And we um, it's kind of funk uh, R and B with a little sense of humor, I think, to it too. Um, you should check out our video, actually. Um, <laughs> I will. I'll check <laughs> it like out. a lot of. A lot of humor in it, I think. Um, but yeah, we're both into like old soul and funk and neo soul kind of stuff. And um, me too. Just like getting, you know, our like love for D'Angelo and like and everything old and jazz funk and stuff like that. Roy Ayers and George. So we're kind of like, oh, definitely. My son is just I, actually like my son's a huge P Funk fan, and uh, he just made a Lego mother. He's nine. He made a Lego mothership. And we got invited to meet George Clinton. Um, that's awesome. And he got to, he got presented to him. It was oh like, oh my god, it was awesome. That's amazing. George is like, I play with Legos too. You know? <laughs> that's fantastic. Uh, you yeah. just bet you just made his entire year. Yeah, he's met him and and Q Tip. So now he's like, those are like two of his favorites. And Q Tip's a big push user, and um, so that that's been really fun. Is like seeing my my hip hop heroes like. De La Soul, Q-Tip, Jazzy Jeff, and um, oh yeah, and I guess Andre Three Thousand's got one on tour now, and like so, it's just like Push Three. You'll be seeing a lot of this summer, I think. So yeah, do you know Alicia? Uh, she is like the head of sound for Lego now. Um, she's Ableton certified trainer. 
I don't. I'd I'd love to meet her though. Actually, that that's that's awesome. I could totally connect you guys if you want. She's uh she was on the podcast a while ago. She used to live in Denver, where I'm at. Yeah, I'd I'd love to. Um, we met somebody there who um, I came to Loop, and she I, her business card was a Lego minifigure with her email address on it that looked like her, and I was like, that's cool. That's I lo- pretty I awesome. Love Lego. I, I play a lot of Legos. Oh, actually, that that brings me to the point of uh, we didn't talk about how Push One was made. Actually, and yeah, if you have another minute, yeah, I'd please, no, I'd love to. So the the first push was like we had done the APC forty. We wanted to design the next thing. I had in mind a drum rack controller. Like I was like, you know, and there we wanted like I wanted like an iPhone dock so you could make beats standalone and. And I think, so, and it was coming along, I had some pretty good designs. And then along the way, Gerhardt was like, you know, it shouldn't just do drums though. It should do everything. And I was like, oh, thanks a lot. You know, <laughs> I was like almost done this design, the pitch to Akai. And um, and so that, but that got me totally like, I have a music theory background. So it was like, okay, how do we do this? And that was kind of how the um, in key mode, chromatic mode, that stuff came about. But the way I prototyped it, because we didn't have a hardware team, it was just me, like, how do I make this happen? So I sawed apart a um, remote SL compact, and a, and I made sure not to you know mess up any circuit boards, but I sawed the keys off of it with a Dremel saw and got a launch pad. And then I had a Livid Brain, which was like this old design-your-own MIDI controller kind of thing, where I glued all the buttons to Legos and made a big Lego grid. And started started moving things around and seeing like what was the best layout. And I, I put like those little label maker labels on each button. I was like, where what's the ergonomic thing? I had weird ones with like hand shapes, like I'm on a Star Trek or like Total Recall kind of thing. But you know, like that's amazing. It, it came out, but my wife would hear me digging in this Lego bin. I'm ordering like bins of custom Legos from <laughs> direct from Lego. And she's like, Are you really working up there? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. The Lego is a big part of push, you know, definitely. That's really cool. Yeah, that's a fun backstory. I'm sure your son probably benefited from that too, because he probably got all the Legos left over, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got, I mean, it's it's a dangerous place to walk in bare feet around here, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, I've seen some good memes about like parents stepping on Legos and like. The sharks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's a real thing. Awesome, man. Well, Jesse, uh, I want to respect your time. Thank you so much for hanging out. Really appreciate you joining the podcast. It's been really fun having you. Yeah, and for me too. If there's any specific links you want me to post in the show notes, um, feel free to send them over. Otherwise, I was going to tag your socials. Perfect. Any last shout outs, upcoming projects you want to share with people before we head out? Uh, no, I got I got a couple albums underway, but it's going to be a little while. Um, also, my hip hop project uh, with Motion Man, and um, uh, we're working on adult situations too, which I think will be coming some point soon. So uh, exciting to get new albums out, but I had to get this push out after seven years before I focused on my albums. So, and there's so much music. I have so much music that I've made on push that I'm just starting to like, how do I catalog this? And, you know, like great. There's a great actually program. I just, I'll shout out this program that I found. um, Yeah. Recently called Makid, M-A-K-I-D. You can load your, all your, Ableton projects into it and it analyzes the BPM and uh Whoa. It, and and you if you have a preview of your set in the project, it'll play, have it right there. So now I've got all my live sets with the preview, the BPM, tagging them, and now I can start to sort them. Wow. It's a game changer. So wait, so it actually creates an it creates an audio preview. It doesn't create the audio preview. That's it's that's a huge wish of mine for live. Just like give me an audio preview of the huge. set so I can remember. Um but this way, if you export it into that set, it'll load the, it'll have a preview of the, whatever the latest one in time is. Um, so that's what I'm doing now. I'm just trying to always export a, like a loop of what I did yeah. you know, so I can identify the songs that way. That's brilliant. I'm going to have to check that out. I love little organizational stuff like that. It makes my life easier. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm like OmniFocus, uh, Keyboard Maestro, you know, Hazel. These, I love all these tools that like, automatically clean up my my stuff yeah 100 percent. i think with ai that kind of thing is just going to be even more streamlined in the near future with all these new tools coming out totally yeah. yeah it's really exciting stuff um also i forgot to mention i didn't write it down the name of the track you released with jonathan stein he was on the podcast really love that song that you released under jethro i was really oh, tight. sweet 
Yeah, it's called Middle Bends. Middle Bends, yeah. Which is um, the reason it has that title is because my my former colleague who's um, headed our sound team, he's from New Zealand, and he was he used to talk about how he always like I used to meet a bunch of Middle Bends back in high school, and that's how he says Metal Bands <laughs> and in Kiwi accent. So I, I love that. Middle, middle Bends, yeah. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, it was a great song. Yeah, Jonathan's so. amazing. I mean, he's just amazing. Uh, like, incredible player. Yeah, on the push, too. I mean, he shreds the push. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, really, like, world. He's, he is, like, yeah. blows our minds, yeah. Uh, there's a, a couple like that. I think, like, him, Straw Elliott from The Roots, and um, and Jamie Blake. These guys are, like, just really incredible. Also, my friend Robert Trusco. You might not know him. Just got an email from Cole telling me to reach out to Robert, and I saw some of his videos. He looks amazing. He is unreal. Uh, I think he was voted like best bass player in Texas or something like that last year. He plays bass, but he also plays the push like a madman. Uh, he and I are about to release a song next week. Oh, sweet. It's probably right up your alley, too, like that funk, soul, neo kind of vibe. Oh, great. Awesome. I'll send it to you if you want to check it out. He and Sounds I worked good, on yeah. it. Cool, man. Yeah, I just, just got an email. I have to email him like this afternoon, so that's awesome. Yeah, I've been meaning to have him on the podcast. So this is a good reminder for that, too. Cool. Awesome, Jesse. Well, enjoy your day, man. Thanks again for joining the podcast. I'll have Katie reach out soon as far as all details when this goes live and all that stuff. Yeah, thanks again. Really appreciate your work and what you do with the Ableton team. Looking forward to seeing Thank more you. updates. Yeah, you too. Maybe we can meet in person someday. So Yeah, I hope so. That'd be cool. I'm in Denver. If you're ever in the area, hit me up. Awesome. Right on. Thank you. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening to the podcast. If you don't hate it, please leave a five-star review wherever you're listening, and that would help me out a ton. Be sure to give this guest a follow, give them some love for spending their time and sharing their wisdom. If you want to be the first to get new episodes and other cool Ableton Live stuff that I'll be sending out, then join the newsletter. Go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter or check out the link in the show notes to this episode. I'm on Instagram a lot, so if you want to go to Ableton Podcast on Instagram, you should be able to find me and and see all the cool stuff that's happening there. Check back on Tuesdays for new episodes. Much love to all of you for listening, and I will see you next time. 